Beatrice, come. Uh, all three of you, come on. Uh, we stand up here. Um, here you are. You can stand over here, Beatrice. And Alice, you can stand oh, oh, here. Okay. Louise, good. Come closer. Okay. <laughs> it's like we're at a bar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it, it, it's been interesting to listen to you. And first, I must say, Louise, when I, I, when I was listening to you, I felt, you know, a bit more oh, pessimistic. You work quite hard. Yeah. You say we're not good enough, right. isn't it? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Are you pessimistic? Is it, you know, is the future black in your, in your point of view? Uh, no, the future's not black. And I think all the stuff that we do is amazing. But I do think we do need to do more. And we are, we are still very marginal. I think particularly for me in my world, I spend all my day talking to people that run innovation agencies and design agencies and, and brilliant projects. And, you know, very quickly it feels like the whole world is about social innovation and it's great and we're doing these new <laughs> things for society. And I go and talk to my friends. They've never heard of it. Um, you know, there's people who spend... I have to spend hours telling people what I do. That's ridiculous. But, okay, <laughs> so, so what's the problem? So what's the problem is that we're not enough successful or we're not good enough to announce or talk about it or where is... Where I, think, I think there's a lot of challenges. So I think there's a challenge around, um, around language and narrative and, and you can definitely talk to this from a mm. government perspective. You know, and and there's, a, there's a debate as to whether it's better to do... Um, innovation outside the system and, and obviously you can't you have to start somewhere so you have to start small and grow big but the the question is and again Alistair will be able to talk to this is when we have these entrepreneurs um, and we have these brilliant innovations that, that are about um, uh, people in small communities it, it often just means that they stay in small communities so there's a scale issue and I'm not suggesting that, you know, not every corner shop needs to be a Walmart. Mm -hmm. We need Walmarts and we need corner shops in society. But in terms of social innovation, I think there's still too many mm -hmm. corner shops. So there's a, there's a question about narrative, there's a question about scale, there's a question about how you start this stuff, whether you do it inside and out. But there's a question also about if we still, if we remain marginal in narrative, then when a big challenge comes up, like either the migrant crisis today or the future of our city centres are completely redundant and we have all these things around data, blah, 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 then it doesn't really make sense if it's only, you know, five of us on the corner in our little community, <coughs> in our little club, who are doing mm. something about it. Uh, Alistair, do you agree with Louise's picture that we are not good enough? I think there's a, d there's a different way to scale it in terms of a thousand flowers bloom. But the problem with allowing a thousand flowers to bloom and uh, the kind of bottom-up stuff that I was describing, is that it's that economically it doesn't make that much sense. In other words, these social entrepreneurs, their target market, the place they actually want to address, has no money. You know, is is the last market that the corporates mm. or uh, mm. would mm. go for. So I think there's a disconnect in the entire debate and discussion between our objective, which is poverty, disadvantage, exclusion, and, and the kind of world of social investment, social innovation, social enterprise, and social entrepreneurship, which are seeking out elusive scale. But of course, you've got this economic imperative that that lot don't have any money. Those markets are broken. And yet, we want to transcend to this much bigger, more important, more influential, scalable, position. So there's a disconnect there. Yeah. Can I just add as well, I think it's the question that we ask as well. So it's not about, um, you know, it's not about how do, um, you know, how does, uh, what's his name? Junior. Junior. Mm -hmm. How does Junior um, help young people in his area to be safe from crime? The question is more, how do we stop crime at a bigger level? Or how do we, how do we create a society where people feel um, where everybody is uh, provided for and looked after for and comfortable that they don't have to steal from other people. Or, you know, what mm. it's, it's about changing the question mm -hmm. at the top. And I think mm. if we just keep doing these entrepreneur things at the bottom we have to and forget yeah. this top bit, yeah. then... Yeah. But Beatrice, when you see it from, from uh, the government perspective, mm. what could you do to, to raise those uh, good flowers, as Alistair says, and actually make uh, a shift in the mind? mind? What can you do? I'm 
Well, I think part of what we are trying to do is kind of is to bring that in government. I think for us, we've got a similar dilemma around kind of at the moment most of the work that we do is comes from departments who are kind of keen and interested and want to do it. So um, the projects that we're working on are important, but they're not all sort of direct, like of central importance. They're not all at the top of the Prime Minister's agenda. They're not all the things that kind of really sort of matter to the centre at the moment in the UK government. Mm. Um, we are kind of in something of a dilemma around how we manage that because we don't want to... to there's something in government about sort of coming from the centre and telling people how to do things, but equally, I think we think that for the policy lab uh, to really have impact and to genuinely make a difference, we need to be working on some of those kind of really big, important things. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously at the moment for the Prime Minister in the UK, for example, that's around um, Brexit, um, but also around uh, social mobility and, and mm. those sorts of questions. So it's something for us about how we kind of help civil servants tackle the big questions. There's something about that second um, um, level I was talking about in helping civil servants get much better generally at kind of uh, connecting and uh, going out into the world and understanding what's happening and sort of being able to come up with new approaches. But I think I'd echo the point about the sort of um, ambition because um, as a policy lab, we're kind of, we're invited to many international conferences we get a lot of international visitors coming to us and a lot of excitement around what we do, which is amazing for us, but we're really tiny mm -hmm. and we're not doing, you know, we're do just... Do you find it difficult to get, the, to get the ears of everyone else? Do you find that you're eight person in a policy lab? Uh, is yeah. it hard to, you know... I mean, it's hard, it's hard even to judge you, Even if we say, oh, Great Britain, you are so yeah. wonderful mm -hmm. in this. Uh, it, it's hard. I think it's, uh, it's kind of partly what Louise was saying, that, that because you're kind of operating in a certain world, so we talk a lot across government, and we do meet plenty of sceptics, but we also talk a lot to the people who are like super engaged and super interested and want to do this stuff. Um, and it's quite hard to know across the whole of government where, how much of an impact you're having because mm -hmm. of, you know, the worlds in which you operate. And, so, and you know, and then you'll go to a part of government that's, that's never heard of any of this stuff that is doing things in the same way it's always done it. Um, and I think, you know, we are very early on in our journey. We've made a very small impact and probably a very small part of government, and we hope to be able to do more, but... It's, we haven't found the solution. <laughs> but you're working on it, and that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Alistair, I was thinking of when you were talking about uh, the importance when you have this school uh, about talking leadership. Uh, is there any differences in, in leadership when it comes to uh, social entrepreneurship and, and what you're talking about leadership in classical entrepreneurship? I mean, for sure, the this balance between money and mission is not a, a balance faced by the commercial counterparts. I mean, they, their proposition is a lot simpler. And you, it's so interesting being with a group of social entrepreneurs through a year, and we, we're working with um, 2,000 social entrepreneurs in five countries every year. But when you're with a group of 20, um, the, a lot of the debate and a lot of the things they're wrestling with throughout the year is how to balance this social impact, how to measure it, how to prove it, how to create more of it, and yet how to create an engine of money in order to do more of it. And, and particularly, how to create that engine of money which is not based on begging or grants mm -hmm. um, or philanthropy, in order, one, for it to be more dignified and less Victorian, but two, for it to be sustainable, and three, for it to scale and grow. And, and inevitably, that means proxy markets or kind of pseudo markets because their, their target market has no money. So, so I would say the, the type of learning and leadership needed in social purpose organizations is that bit more complex than their commercial counterparts. Um, and... Um, and therefore, it needs that sort of dedicated space for those people to navigate that quite complex proposition. Louise, finally, uh, you were talking about most of the challenges yeah. that we should be better. Um, we should go up here. We will be. We should have some Walmarts, mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship Walmarts. Mm. But if you if you look in the future, where do you think social entrepreneurship will be in ten years? Oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Um, I don't know. I hope we will be, I think, 
I hope our systems will have more capacity. I hope, you know, there'll be lots of little policy labs inside government. I hope that um, universities will be thinking more about themselves as part of communities. Um, as, as here in Malmo, rather than isolated islands that are only for elite people to learn, um, I hope that corporates will recognize that CSR, I, if, if I want someone to paint my wall, I'll get a painter. Um, I don't want KPMG to come and do it. So I hope that corporates will start to recognize and, and use their value um, and use their skills in a different way to benefit society rather than just feeling guilty and, and wanting to do something. So I have no idea what it will be, but I hope that all of our institutions, every single one of them, will embed innovation in the way they do it and have have more of a social conscious rather than just people like Junior having to have a social conscious because he's been involved in it. Mm. Beatrice Andros from the Pol Policy Lab in the UK Cabinet. Thank you for coming. Alistair Wilson from the School of Entrepreneur and Louise Pulford from the Social Innovation Exchange. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And we won't, we won't give you a book in Swedish, uh, <laughs> though we think your, your Swedish is probably great, but maybe you Thank prefer you. chocolate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>